Hi, and welcome to another edition of Studio 411. I'm your host, Larry De Silva. Well, we have an interesting show for you. We have a uh, young lady who's certainly been in the uh, uh, business of uh, show business, writing, comedy writing for many years. Susan Silver is going to be joining us today for the hour. She's written a fascinating new book called Hot Pants in Hollywood, Sex, Secrets, and Sitcom, uh, published by High Mountain Press. And for more information on Susan and the book, uh, Hot Pants in Hollywood.com. Susan, welcome to Studio 411. How are you? Hi, very well. How are you? Great, great. Now tell me, uh, um, what was the inspiration? Do I have hot pants on? No. No, no, no. <laughs> No, Susan There's and I. Nothing on below my sweater. Go on. S Susan and I had to talk about that before the show started. Uh, what was the inspiration for this uh, clever, funny memoir? Other than your life, what what made you at this point in your life decide uh, I've got to put uh, all these stories uh, in in a uh, a book? Well, I had talked to the people at Vanity Fair about doing an article. I call myself the Ms. Zelig of the Woody Allen character. I I've met almost every icon of my generation, and I thought it would make a good article. And once we did it, we said, well, maybe it makes a book. So it became a book, and it kind of took off from there. Now, originally, Susan from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And now, uh, I'm, uh, what do they call that state? Is that the cheese state? The cheese heads. Yeah, the cheese heads. There you go. Yeah. Now, Susan likes my. It's a my great place to grow up, but then you have to leave. Oh, they, oh, I, oh, it's mandatory you have to leave. You must leave. <laughs> Unless you're, but you get oh. a great childhood and you get great values and Midwest and all that stuff, then you leave. Unless you're a Packers fan, of course. Uh, an only child like yours truly. Now, uh, did you get your uh, independent uh, nature, such as I think mine is from being an only? You know, it's so interesting because I just read something recently about someone, a writer, and it said he was so good at being alone because he was an only child. I, I really never thought of it before, but yes, I, I guess we learn to occupy ourselves and play with, you know, with dolls and make up stories, and we don't have other kids to play with all the time, so we become independent. Because uh, I was thinking your obviously very vivid imagination, which comes in handy uh, uh, in your writing, your comedy writing over the years, of course, from reading the book, I gathered uh, scripts probably only known to you and your family. A lot of the ideas and characters were in some cases drawn from real people or experiences in your own life. Yeah, I say I, I honestly didn't know you were allowed to make things up. So when I first went in to pitch the Mary Tyler Moore stories, I only came in with stories from my own life. And then as I started working more, I started running out of stories. And if I had a meeting on Wednesday and nothing happened to me on Tuesday, I was like panicked going through the phone book, you know, airport, airplane, because I didn't realize you were allowed to make it up. But I always think that the best stories come from reality and from truth. Now, you talk in the book, uh, and I'm quoting, I am my own mystery. Uh, explain that to us. Well, you know, we think we know ourselves, but when you're doing something like a book and you're going over everything and memories and trying to figure out stuff, you, you realize that you don't always know why you do things or how you get through them, but you do. The the themes of the, the, the stuff of the book is showbiz and my life afterward but the themes are resilience we're much more resilient than we think we are and i've gone through some dark times too and illness and things reinvention i believe every 20 years as we're living older we have to reinvent ourselves and relationships those are the three themes and the three important things that i hope the book tells people aside from all the gossip and juicy stories there you go uh, plenty of those for sure. Uh, Susan Silver joining us here for the hour on Studio 411. The book Hot Pants in Hollywood, Sex, Secrets and Sitcoms, published by High Mountain Press. For more information, hotpantsinhollywood.com. Um, WWW, I think you have to say. Uh, no, no, believe it or not, I used to say that, and now folks are so savvy. I mean, it, we have it. Oh. Uh, we, we actually have it scrolled, so they'll see that for those okay. th those like in our age bracket who may not yeah, know right. that. For, for elderly people, it's WWW. There you go. I want to show a picture that I guess a friend of yours who's an artist uh, uh, did of you uh, with kind of a, a high back chair. And, uh, this is a great artist. 
Chris, I wish he were a friend. He's a very famous guy um, named uh, Douglas Robertson, and he does all the Mac ads and Estee Lauder, and my friend got him to do this for me. It's a fabulous gift. I love it. I have stationery with that on. It's great. It's uh, Susan is all legs. Unfortunately, we can't see that on, on Susan today, but if, <laughs> if we can ever drag her uh, here into the studio, we will we will see an exact I'll mirror. I'll my legs with we, we'll, we'll see an exact mirror image of, of this. Um, you talk about in the book, and I thought it was great because I don't think a lot of people can uh, say this statement that, that you talk about that, and I got the feeling too, that you got your writing talent or your writing abilities, I think, from your dad because you later in life, perhaps after he passed, if I recall, uncovered uh, some um, writings or some belongings of his. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. Uh, yeah. you know, your dad was a pretty smart guy. My father was a brilliant man. He taught himself to paint. He taught himself to play the piano. He was an attorney, but he always wanted to write. And he retired at an early age and wrote a lot of short stories and articles. He was always trying to send things out. And when he passed on, I found he, I did his obituary for the Milwaukee Journal, and he had done about 60 articles and things for them. And yeah, he was a he was a wonderful, brilliant guy, and I think I got a lot of my my writing stuff from him. And then I had an uncle who was in showbiz. I probably got some of my sense of humor from him. So. And tell us who your uncle was, because I, well, I. My uncle was Cy Howard. Was a, a pretty famous director writer. He did a, a show called My Friend Irma, and that's my boy. He kind of discovered uh, Martin and Lewis, and he lived out in California. So that was my kind of hook to get out there, because my parents didn't want me to leave the house. And we have a shot of your uncle there. Of course, at one point he was married. I guess it would have been. Oh, he's married to Gloria Graham. Gloria Graham, who a lot of folks in that picture that I have is a brunette. But folks who are a movie aficionados would remember her uh, for many movies. She also won an Oscar at one point in the early 50s. But most of uh, the folks, including myself, remember her from uh, her uh, role in uh, the classic holiday movie, It's a Wonderful Life, a very talented Yeah, she actress. had a small part in that, but she went on to great things. And and there's a movie about her life now with Annette Benning. I'm not too crazy about the movie, but she was a very lovely but troubled person. Uh, now, because of your, your uncle, uh, family connections exposed you to uh, showbiz glamour. Do you, do you think that that really was the catalyst? Because a lot of folks, you know, don't have that, that kind of in, in a sense, of by knowing someone. Do you think that that would have uh, made it much more difficult to wind up uh, with the career that you did have if you didn't have someone who was in the New York Hollywood scene? Yeah, no, the truth of it was, well, I went to Northwestern for two years, and then my uncle said I could live with him out in California, but my mother made him promise me that, he, that I wouldn't go into the business, so he never helped me because he was afraid of my mother. So I was sort of there and in it, but I had to move out of his house and kind of do everything on my own. I got myself a job as an extra in the movies in college for the summer, but he was a, a wonderful uncle, and I loved him, but he didn't want me in the business. There you go. And now help me out here. There was a, a, a woman who you went to high school with, and I, I don't want to mispronounce her name. I guess she Bernadine was. Doran there was you one go. Of the they were first. like psychic, uh, Susan and I. <laughs> and now, yeah, she, she was. Tell, tell the audience, because I had heard of her, but I really uh, want you to. How, how was she best known in the late 60s uh, for what escapades? I say she was a weatherman, not the meteorological kind, but the building up, you know, blowing up buildings kind. She and her husband, Bill Ayers, were these weathermen in the SDS movement. And um, she also went to Northwestern, but she was uh, obviously uh, a very activist kind of person, which I never knew. We were in modern dance. I never picked up on that. But she had to go on the run and was arrested eventually by the FBI and now has redeemed herself. She's a law professor. Have you, have you ever had occasion to uh, run into her or catch up with her? I haven't. You know, it's funny. She's been out in Aspen. I go there every summer, and one time I tried to connect, but we were off timing, so... There you go. I'll have to see if I can stage a reunion. That ought to be, uh -oh. some, that ought to be some show. <laughs> the, <laughs> the, weather, the, the weather girl and Susan. I can see another book coming out of that. Um, <laughs> now, uh, again, in, in college, uh, uh, quite a few people. I almost think it's kind of the Midwest Syracuse. Syracuse is very well known for uh, uh, a lot of famous folks, especially in media and sports. But Northwestern, that's where you started out in college. 
and uh, uh, you actually started as a journal journalism major. What what happened? Well, um, you really have read the book. This is great, Lair. Um, I wanted to be a journalist, I thought. And when I got there in the School of Journalism, it was a very tough school to get into. I, I'm very proud of one thing. I had the lowest math boards ever to go to Northwestern University. I'm very proud of that. 444. But my English and my activities were good. So anyway, when I went there, I was in journalism school. And I realized, like, the first semester, I wasn't interested in presenting the facts, who, what, where. What. I wanted to do something more creative. So I was uh, a showgirl in their um, comedy show. We had a university comedy show, and I also wrote a sketch for that. It was the first time I wrote anything really funny that I heard actors perform, so that kind of told me what I wanted to do was write comedy, and I had to leave and go to UCLA to do that. There we go. I was going to say, you've done pretty well for yourself financially, so I guess uh, two plus two equals big bucks. <laughs> What is two plus two? I, four, but you said you had the lowest math boards. Of, uh, uh, yes, I did. Good. Right. I did. Every time I hear now, I mean, not that you hear it all the time, people say a train is leaving the station, my eyes glaze over. I, I can't do anything with math or word problems. Wow. Wow. All right. I'll have to send her some problems. <laughs> Susan Silver. Checks. That's better. There I you go. Check here for a residual of one cent. Susan Silver uh, joining us here for the hour on Studio 411. We've got a shot of Susan here uh, on the lower right in one of the first shows that she uh, really made a name for herself, uh, the uh, the old Mary Tyler Moore show, again with uh, uh, Mary and all her cast of characters, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that shortly. Um, you transferred to UCLA. Um, in your later collegiate career, again, with the help of your, uh, your uncle. And um, at that point, you know, uh, you obviously, as you said earlier, you got exposed to uh, working with, uh, uh, as an extra, and also you got into the, uh, the union, as they say, so that, that helped you get to some exposure there as well. You, you're making it sound like people were exposing themselves in front of me, Larry. We have to be very careful these days. Yeah. With that, you know, back we, in the day, no one exposed. We can edit to that out. So no. <laughs> <laughs> why? <laughs> But uh, yeah, so you uh, uh, you actually got to uh, even be an extra on uh, Viva Las Vegas, right, with Elvis. Yeah, in the book, I have a lot of pictures and yeah. stories of people. I was a showgirl. I guess I was always a showgirl in Viva Las Vegas, and then um, I had encounters with Steve McQueen, with Clint Eastwood. It was it was a fun time. And uh, now you knew uh, you knew Jim Morrison of the Doors for those uh, who might not remember a very uh, very famous sort of rock and roll uh, uh, posthumously may I add rock and roll Hall of Famer you actually knew Jim uh, when you guys were at UCLA together uh, we have a photo of Jim I want to say I think it's from his high school yearbook so oh, did he have the little bowl haircut he yes yes yeah yeah very creepy, very shy, similar to the wonderful guy. But how he got his persona, I write about it in the book, um, we were two shy, quiet people, and we hung out with a couple that were motorcycle bikers, Max and Liz. They were very sophisticated. They wore leather, and Max had the long hair and the whole look that Jim took. And they were the grown-ups, and we were like the little kids. And I think he took his whole persona from Max. When I was doing research on the book, I found out Max Schwartz, his name was, he grew up to be a very famous beat poet in San Francisco. Unfortunately, he passed on, but um, yeah, that was, I think, Jim's role model. There you go. Well, he certainly picked a good one because obviously yeah. until his uh, untimely death or some think he, he might still lovely, be alive. He was a lovely, lovely guy, yeah. very sensitive, very sweet guy. There was actually a lady, I don't know if you ever knew her, her name is Charlotte Stewart. I don't know Charlotte personally. She played Miss Beetle on Little House on the Prairie, and she apparently in later years, uh, after you knew Jim, spent some time with Jim and even has some uh, home movies of him. And again, uh, he was very kind of, you know, uh, introverted guy, but you know, you yes. get him up on stage and my goodness. Used to write poetry and sit by the yeah. lunch wagon and was darling, darling yeah. guy. Uh, you talk in the book about uh, Francis Ford Coppola. Uh, he advised you when you were in grad school on a screenplay you were writing. Actually, you won, uh, you won an award for that, didn't you? He was my graduate teacher. In grad I did one semester of graduate study, or one year actually, and we wrote a screenplay in his class, and I got an A, very proud, and then I won an award from the Writers Guild. I was the only, um, I was the youngest person to win the award for that uh, movie that he had helped me. 
And then very quickly, uh, we, uh, you have to tell the story. Uh, I'll, I'll set it up for you. There was a show in the early to mid-60s. It was kind of when the folk music uh, craze was going on. It was a show that aired, I, I vaguely remembered, called Hoot Nanny. Oh, and yeah. I, guess, I guess you uh, encountered a, a gentleman uh, who uh, uh, seems to be in the news uh, more so than ever. But, uh, well, I'll tell you the story back then, and then I had a bizarre follow-up. Tell us here. about uh, Mr. Cosby. Yeah, um, there was a show called Hood and Annie where they would go to different colleges and have collegiate audiences and all the Western singers, etc. And a friend of my uncle's named Bullets Durgan was a manager and he said, do you want to be on TV? I said, sure I do. He said, well, I'll get you in in the audience of this show called Hoot and Annie and you sit in the front row and be very animated. And if they like you, they'll have you come to the second show and then you'll come to the cast party, which is at Theodore Bacall's house. So I said, well, how will I get there? And he said, you'll go with my client, Bill Cosby. Well, I had no idea who that was because he hadn't done anything yet. So I go to the show. I'm sitting. I'm very animated. Second show, I'm very animated. And Bill Cosby comes out, and he does his act. He had just done his first album, comedy album. And afterwards, um, we went to the party. He was very nice. I was kind of quiet at the party, a little intimidated. And on the way home, he said, I'll drive you home. I said, fine. And he had a little sports car. He told me he had just gotten engaged and he had done this album and he was going to be a big comedic star. And I said, wow. And he said, what do you want to do when you grow up? I said, I want to be a comedy writer. So he said, well, why don't you work on my second album? So I said, really? He said, yeah. I said, well, how, how will we do that? He said, well, you'll come over uh, to the office and we'll pitch material and everything. And I was like so excited. We got to my apartment. He pulled up to the street and he lunged at me. And I did what I call the Lucille Ball exit. I fell out of the car with my legs up in the air and he drove away. Wow. So I was very, very lucky because at the time it would have ruined my life. I was the little Jewish virgin. It would have really ruined my life. Per perhaps, he was just, perhaps he was just reaching for the door to open yeah, the right, door for you. Through my breast. <laughs> so what happened afterward, uh, you know, he becomes who he is, etc. And um, I told the story at my book party last year, and they put it in page six as a little item, considering he was so in the news. And this is, this is so bad. I mean, it's the only time I'm glad my mother's not alive anymore. The National Enquirer picked it up. And my, my PR person called and said, are you sitting down? I said, why? They said, well, the National Enquirer today is a huge headline. It says, sitcom vet escapes sex fiend. Oh. There's a picture of me now, so I look like I'm a cougar. And he has this young, handsome guy. It was like the worst thing that ever happened to me, but or, or not. But it felt like it at the time. But anyway, yeah, that's so it, it, it came around today. Fortunately, I escaped him. I escaped several gropers, actually. I didn't have a, a bad time like that. I was very I'm lucky. telling you, very, very uh, athletic and very nimble to escape. Uh, yes, <laughs> especially with my legs up like that, like Su a V. Susan Silver, uh, currently sitting down, I may add, uh, joining us. <laughs> Joining us for the hour here on Studio 411, uh, the book Hot Pants in Hollywood, Sex, Secrets, and Sitcom, uh, Sitcoms, rather, uh, uh, published by uh, High Mountain Press. For more information, uh, www.hotpantsinhollywood.com. Uh, another uh, icon uh, that, who uh, uh, has left us quite a while ago, but uh, uh, you have a, a, a quick story to tell about him, uh, the great comedian Lenny Bruce, who published Probably would have a field day if he was alive today, but um, your your uncle chaperoned a date with him. I guess what his mom uh, helped set that up. Yeah, I was in college and I was at UCLA and I was at a New Year's Eve party and there was this funny little woman who had been a stripper and was very amusing and sort of entertaining us all. And she said to me, "Are you single?" And I kind of my date was in the corner of there. I said, "Yes, I am." And she said, well, "I'm going to fix you up with my son." So I said, who's your son? She said, Lenny Bruce. I was like, oh, my God, because Lenny Bruce at the time was very renowned, shall we say. It was very controversial. He was also very sexy and very handsome. I said, great. I went home. I was living at my uncle's. He said, you're not going on that date with Lenny Bruce. I said, why? He said, because you're a little Jewish virgin and he's a druggie. You're not going. I said, oh, please. He said, no, the only way you can go is if I go with you. So I said, fine. So we went to see him at a club called the Crescendo, and afterward we all sat around a table, the three of us. He and my uncle got along fabulously. I was scared to death. 
And uh, not long before uh, Lenny uh, left us, unfortunately, uh, Lenny had uh, some demons of his own. But uh, again, uh, uh, certainly fascinating story and set up by his well, mom, no less. That's pretty, pretty amusing. Now, as the he, um, you know, the, the, he did. He died of an overdose. I'll tell you something. Also, a, a current follow up. They, his daughter, um, Kitty, gave his papers. It's the 50th anniversary of his death, and she gave his papers to Brandeis, and they had a seminar on free speech and First Amendment, and I called up to see if I could go, and they said, well, why do you want to go? I said, well, I knew him, so they said, would you come and speak? So all these very heavy-duty First Amendment and all these things there, and I'm talking about how I went out with him. It was a very weird experience. Yeah, oh, yeah. I did an academic seminar on Lenny. Very good, very good. Now, uh, as the 60s moved on, I want to say, well, fill me in on the year. I want to say it was around, like, 67 or 68. You, uh, you got a job working as you kind of started to move, uh, progress in the business. You got a job uh, uh, on the uh, Mort Saul show, uh, Mort being uh, another used seem to have a thing for comedians I, I, I picked up from this so uh, uh, Mort of course uh, who's still alive as we tape uh, uh, you, you he does a show out of an armchair in a club in Mill Valley really really yeah, yeah. Podcast. Yeah. But uh, you actually progressed. Uh, it was almost like being in the Trump administration. You progressed rapidly <laughs> to where you were. You know, uh, was, you I, were was, I was dating my ex-husband at the time. We were at a party and this sort of roly poly guy was coming on to me and he said, I can get you in show business. I said, oh, good. You know, he said, do you want to what do you want to do? I said, I want to be in television, you know, and I want to write. He said, well, I work for Mort Saul. I produce his show. Do you want to be the assistant to the associate producer? So I said, yeah, fabulous. So I was there like six weeks, and every week someone got fired ahead of me, including the guy who had gotten me the job. And by the seventh week, I was the producer. <laughs> it was the weirdest thing. And then I got fired. Mort we're was a we're little, looking at um, a shot of Mort, I think a few years earlier, with the uh, the great Ed Sullivan. Uh, Mort, of course, like I said, was uh, in, is considered... Uh, along with Lenny and so many of the folks that you came in contact with, one of the uh, uh, greatest uh, revered comics of, of all time, not just of his generation. Uh, if we can get political. a shot. He was brilliant politically, yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, again, it's, I would love to know what he has to say about, uh, you know, what's been going on the last oh, uh, 10 sure. years. Well, look up this podcast. He does it like once a month or something. We have a great shot of Susan from a magazine uh, circa 1970. The writer wore hot pants. So uh -oh. uh, there you go. Uh, I did. I apologize to all the feminists out there. I apologize to Gloria Steinem. I, but she was a bunny for a of story. Course, so, yeah. you know, for some reason, I wore hot pants to meetings. I don't know why. But someone got a hold of it, and they did this fabulous, incredible article about me in TV Guide. And it kind of opened the door to everything, all the publicity and everything. Um, then when I wanted to use it for my book, I couldn't because TV Guide owned it. So I had an illustrator do a kind of an homage to that photo. There you photo. go. Now, shortly before that, because I'm assuming that's probably when you were on the Mary Tyler Moore and Maud and all the other great shows that you wrote for in the 70s, uh, you had a great job. Oh, my goodness. I think uh, folks like us that grew up with this program would have killed for. You were an assistant casting director with the iconic show Laugh-In, uh, working with Dan Rowan, Dick Martin, George Slaughter, uh, a cast of zanies to be sure. Yeah, that I, I had done some casting for advertising after the Mort Saul job, and I saw in the paper, back in the day we could get jobs in the newspaper, it was a different world, uh, for a show that was going to come on in the fall called Rowan and Martin's Laughing, and I said, I can do that. I did casting and advertising. I can do casting in this. So I got a job as an assistant to this very famous casting guy, older man, and he died I had nothing to do with it. Like the second week he died and I was there and I got his job. I don't know, I, I don't know how this kept happening to me, but it did. You seem but to have a knack for director. right place at the and right there time. I met everybody in the world from Tiny Tim to, you know, Lily Tomlin to Barbie Benton and everybody. Goldie Hawn, Ruth Buzzy, you know, the, the list goes. And those were the regulars. Imagine the, uh, the guest stars that you, uh, you interacted with. Um, a quick story on another uh, uh, music icon that uh, I, I didn't even realize that you got to meet. Uh, uh, tell us quickly, uh, you, Tom Jones, your story oh, about Tom. Oh, my Tom Jones story. I have a picture of him in the kitchen. Um, I was married at the time, and I, one of my jobs was to get 
guests to come and say sake to me, which is what all the people did. So even on my honeymoon, I was like running down the beach in Hawaii after David Jansen. You know, my husband was like, oh, my God, this is going to be a strange marriage. Anyway, uh, they wanted me to get Tom Jones, and he was guesting on the Smothers Brothers show. So I got over there to the to the studio, and I was drinking water out of, we called it the bubbler in Wisconsin. You call it the water fountain. I was bending over, and some guy said to me, oh, cute. And I turned around, and it was Tom Jones. I said, oh, this is so good. I came to get you to be on the show, laugh. And he said, well, I can't talk now, but afterward, meet my assistant, and we'll go for a bite to eat, and you'll tell me about it. So I called my husband to ask him if I could go. That's what we did back in the day. And he said, of course. So um, Tom Jones' assistant and he and I drove down Sunset Boulevard in this convertible. like It was like out of some Rebel Without a Cause movie. With the top down, they were gunning the motor. It was really weird. And so we got to the hotel, and we I thought we were going to dinner, but we went up to the room, and the assistant left. And there I was. And at the time, I had this fall on, this thing that you saw in the um, TV Guide article. It was like a hair thing that we put on in the back of our hair. So I was up in the room, and I was like, oh, my God. He kind of made a move to kiss me, and I thought, number one, I'm married. Number two, my fall is going to fall off, which was, like, more important. So I said to him, I can't do that. I'm, I'm married. And he said, okay, you know, no problem. Anyway, he came on the show. He was a very nice guy. About a year later, I said to my ex, it was my husband. I said, let's go to Vegas and see Tom Jones, and then let's go see him afterward. So he said, he's not going to, re- you can't get in there. I said, yes, we can. We knock on the door after the show, and the door opens, and I said, I don't know if you remember me, and Tom Jones said, yeah, you're the one who said no. Wow. There I'm we the go. only person who ever said no to Tom Jones. In the there world. you go. See, a first for everything. Our guest, <laughs> our guest who's in remember? silver. Absolutely. I'm sure he would today if we ever asked Tom that question. <laughs> Hot Pants in Hollywood, Susan Silver, writer, author, joining us here on the hour for uh, Studio 411, Sex, Secrets, and Sitcoms, published by High Mountain Press. For more information, hotpantsinhollywood.com. A quote from the book uh, from uh, your uh, co-writing partner at one point and also also, uh, better known as uh, author of the uh, book and later movie Beaches, uh, Iris Rayner Dart. Girl, you've had some life. Funny true, painful, and hopefully uh, a gutsy woman's journey through the years. Uh, we were feeling our way. How did you do it, Susan? You've got to read it to believe it. So again, some good words from someone who uh, you uh, you wrote with and uh, went on yeah, to... Yeah, uh, still my, my best close friend, good friend. And now you tell a story. I've seen some other interviews that... Uh, some interviews that you did uh, where uh, folks seem to uh, get the mistaken idea that you wrote a script or uh, had a script uh, actually air for the show That Girl, which starred Marlo Thomas. You wrote a script that was looked at, but because it didn't fit in the kind of scheme of the show, they decided not to use it. Well, Iris and I uh, became partners. I met her when I was working at Laugh-In, and we kind of wrote in my office when no one knew what we were doing. And she was managed by Gary Marshall, the late, great Gary Marshall. And he had a group of young writers he worked with. And we did a Love American style for him. And then we did a That Girl. We had a meeting with the producers. We pitched the story. And it was about Anne Marie's engagement, Marlo Thomas's engagement to her boyfriend, Donald. And we wrote the script, and they liked it very much. But she was very much a feminist. She was very much control back there at that time also and she decided she didn't want Anne Marie to get married it would kind of ruin the whole single girl thing so they never shot our show but they did pass there you go because if I recall the last year she was kind of semi engaged to the uh, act in other words in the in the show the the boyfriend Donald the boyfriend, Donald, yeah. Donald Hollinger if I recall and if I recall I think he wrote for a, a magazine called People or something or other anyway it was a, ahead of its time in that sense uh, to go back to when you were at Laugh-In obviously that was kind of the old boys network where you know women didn't a lot of times get in I found it interesting that in later years when that show was still on and you had moved on to bigger and better things they had people like Ann Elder who a, a well-known writer in her own right who then started writing for that show but yet you weren't given that opportunity so I mean it was kind of tough to to break into that kind of variety show when every writer was a male 
Well, um, last year, the New York Times did a, a series of articles called Because I Was a Girl, and they asked for stories of gender discrimination, and I told them what had happened to me back in the day. I, I said to George Slaughter, I want to be a writer, really. He said, well, you can't be. And I said, why? And he said, because the writers are all guys. I said, well, so what? I'm the writer's assistant. I was doing that as a second job. You know, I'm in there. I know what to do. He said, no, no, no. They're in an apartment in a different office, and they want to walk around in their shorts and fart. So I said, yeah. He said, well, you can't be there because they won't feel comfortable doing this. I said, farting is keeping me from being a writer. So when I told that story to the New York Times, I figured they'd want to say passing gas or something. But they didn't. They said fart. So I got the New York Times to say fart. I'm very proud of that. But anyway. um, Sounds like this show right here. But that's another story. What? (laughs) I said it sounds like this show. But that's a whole other other story. But continue, please. Oh, so. um, No, so George didn't allow me to be a writer. So Iris and I would write in my office. And once we sold the Love American style and we sold the that girl and then she took a break to have a baby. And I saw the Mary Tyler Moore show. I said to Gary, get me on that show. I can do it. And I quit my job. Wow, that's a pretty bold move at this point. And again, for those of you who don't know, Gary Marshall, again, uh, just uh, another iconic figure who passed away uh, uh, not long ago. Uh, he was director of Happy Days, uh, uh, Odd pretty Couple, uh, I mean, uh, director of Pretty Women, uh, Woman, and just on and on, the uh, Prince's Diary movies. Always did kind of a Hitchcock thing, and a lot of his movies in later years, he would always kind of, kind of appear in a scene, but he was never like had necessarily a speaking role. So he kind of like. He was an actor, though. He did a lot of parts. He did a lot of things for. Uh, he did Mur- in Murphy Brown. He played the network guy. He was an Albert Brooks. There you go. Yeah, he it was. was he was kind of like my best friend and my manager and my mentor. And who was after the- I got divorced, he hired my husband, who became a very successful writer producer through Gary. Arthur Arthur Silver, which that I yeah. found interesting because he really didn't have a background in that. And he was then a stockbroker, but yeah. he used to help me all the time pitch stories. And I said he's really funny and. When we got divorced, he didn't want to be a stockbroker anymore. So I said to Gary, maybe he should work for you. And he he did a fab, you know, at, at an older age, he took a very junior job and he became the producer of Happy Days and Laverne and Shirley. And he had a very good career. Gary uh, uh, will read a quote that uh, uh, obviously he uh, contributed to the book shortly before his passing. Uh, quote, Susan Silver examines everything funny, including her own life, a talented writer whose book should be read by those who like to laugh. Again, uh, the late Gary Marshall. And uh, speaking of which, acting too, and I didn't see this show because I, I thought it was a terrible show, frankly, but uh, the, the revival of The uh, Odd Couple a couple of years ago, he actually did a, a role that I think it aired just after after his passing, but again, oh, he mo- was a consultant on it. I think. Yeah, but no, but he actually did appear in one of the card playing scenes, if I recall. Uh, you know, on on the one that starred Matthew Perry, the the later yeah. version. But yeah, uh, seemed like a very nice guy. Uh, now again, wonderful w- guy. He was my really my my entree into the business and my dearest friend for many many years. There you go. Uh, now, obviously, you got uh, the job as a script writer, uh, uh, one of the first, if not the first, female writer on the Mary Tyler Moore Show. Uh, again, uh, tell me about that. Uh, just a stellar cast of people and. Just a real professional operation from what I uh, got from the book. Well, Gary got me in a book. I said to him, I can do that show. He said, well, you've never written a script on your own. I said, I can do it. And he said, okay, I'll back you. And he called them up. And it was a mid-season show. And I went in and I pitched four stories from my own life. And they thought it was, like, really amazing because they had... They had one woman writer, Treva Silverman, but mostly men. So they didn't realize that most women have the same stories. I'm sure any woman could have gone in with the stories I pitched. But they chose a story where you have to stand up for a wedding for someone you don't like and you have to wear a really ugly dress. So um, that was my first show. And then I I did uh, four more. And then I did some new hearts. And it was, they were the best guys. I I say seriously and jokingly, it was like starting on top and then it was downhill for the next 20 years because they gave you a whole day to break a story. They were very giving. They encouraged you. They, they let you come to the table. They let you come to the taping. It was a wonderful, wonderful group of people to be involved with. 
Now, you talk about in the book then uh, as the the years progressed and then you were involved in quite a few shows uh, through even throughout the 80s up until probably the end of that decade. But uh, you talk in the book how um, you later uh, wound up almost turning down or backing away from writing. Was that a question of quality over quantity or did you just find yourself kind of uh, not not being fulfilled by uh, by what you were doing in later years? It was, it was two things. Um, in 1989, we had a Writers Guild strike, and I was divorced at the time, and I just took a trip to New York, and I was always kind of afraid to be in New York, because that was where the grown-ups were, and it was tough there, and I thought, oh, I really like it here. I sold my house, I sold my car in three weeks, I moved to New York, and I retired. One of the reasons was, um, there's something I, I call it, I don't call it, it's called development hell. You can earn a really good living, you can work all the time, and things don't get made. I did a lot of episodes, but just for two years. Then I did pilots for my own shows. I did 15 pilots. None of them ever were made. I was paid. I had great credits. I did 15 movies of the week. Two of them were made. They were both top 10 movies. The rest weren't made. I did five features. You just feel like you're writing into a void, and I just needed to change my life. So I say reinvention. I moved to New York and I took a year off to decide what else I wanted to do. Back in the mid 70s, uh, Susan, again, with that running theme that I've kind of like uh, uh, fished out of the book, dated another comedian a few times, the uh, the late, great uh, Freddie Prinze Sr. Uh, many of oh, you may, may know no, from Chico well, and the Man. not really. I mean, what happened was I was at NBC and he was just this darling kid and he was like had a crush on me or something and I said I can't go out with you you're like 12 years old you know so um we went out once and he was just a darling dear guy and I say I always feel he was so young he couldn't cope with everything if he only were a little older he would have known whatever he was going through would have passed but he did you know he did commit suicide and he was a sweet guy I just went out with him once and it wasn't really you know a date. <laughs> well, at least you didn't have to leap out of the car. So that, that's, this is true. That's, where, that's where I think I was trying to draw the distinction, shall <laughs> we say. Uh, another gentleman, again, that didn't necessarily date him, but of course uh, uh, was interested in your comments on him. Uh, you uh, got to know, uh, if I recall from the book, uh, Johnny Carson. Uh, uh, give us a little bit, if tidbit, on uh, a very complex individual as the, uh, as the years yeah, have gone on. You know, um I was hired to do, he had a production company and he bought Plaza Suite, the Neil Simon plays. And I had to go interview to be a scriptwriter. And I went in and I had a very nice meeting with him, whatever, you know. And then about two, three months later, I was in um, Palm Springs at a celebrity tennis match and he, we were all at a party and he was standing behind a potted plant. He was so non-social and shy and he wouldn't talk to anybody. It was weird, but I mean, he was very nice to me. I mean, I, I didn't ever have a problem with him. But years later, I was in New York and I was sleeping and I woke up in the middle of the night and my TV was on and I heard Johnny Carson say my name. And I thought I was dreaming, Larry. I thought, you know, did I hear that? And I looked at the TV and he was holding up my doer's profile. There was an ad campaign and I was one of them. And he said he was doing a sketch called The Pure's Profile. And he used my ad as an example. And then he said, wait a minute, I know her. It was the weirdest experience. I, and then I went back to sleep. I thought maybe I did dream the whole thing. <laughs> Other people saw it too. It, it, yeah, it definitely sounds like an out-of-body experience. <laughs> but I'll take your word for it. Now, yeah, speak, it was true, though. Speaking of complex guys, uh, you had an opportunity. You, uh, it's interesting. You, you, we, we can safely assume that you were definitely dated comedians, uh, willingly or unwillingly, or at least were in their company. Um, you dated uh, people sometimes that were kind of maybe between marriages or between relationships. You had an opportunity to uh, uh, spend time with Steve McQueen, and that didn't uh -oh. quite happen. Uh, Clint Eastwood, you know, again, uh, and I love the one where then years later you went up to Clint, not realizing that his new wife was now standing next to him. That was right. That I was, said you may not remember, but yeah. you asked me out a couple times over the years, and blah blah blah. And now I'm single, and you're. He said this is my wife. And, and I'm like, and I'm uh, sure Clint uh, was wishing that you would disappear like Dirty Harry. <laughs> <laughs> he was nice. He was nice. Right. 
Uh, we have a shot here on the monitor. I wanted to bring it up while we have it up. Uh, a, a lovely woman who passed away in 2017, uh, the legendary Mary Tyler Moore. Uh, you, you lived in an apartment uh, complex in New York City that Mary uh, resided in for a time. No, uh, next door. Yeah, she tell, uh, door. tell, she tell. Lived next door to me. I, I'm in my place now. She was actually two buildings away. We wound up living on the same block. It was quite amazing. And her um, husband, uh, Dr. Robert Levine, had a wonderful private memorial for her in January, and I went to it, and it was just amazing. Um, yeah, it was weird, though, that we wound up on the same block. And a uh, nice lady. Uh, you obviously worked with her, but then, uh, you know, you had an opportunity to know her a little bit off, off, the, uh, off the set, as they say. Very private person, very quiet. Yeah. Very lovely. Just the Mary that you thought she was. Yeah. Uh, another thing, too, about from reading the book, and again, we're talking with Susan Silver here on the, the Hour Studio 411, uh, the book Hot Pants in Hollywood, published by High Mountain Press. Um, and I go back to a saying that, uh, and I'm taking it out of context, in baseball, if you get three hits out of ten, you're considered a success. In your book, you, you had several uh, uh, opportunities, events that happen were like so many people, but I think because when a person is more well known, they stand out more. You turned down certain jobs or then, you know, took others that perhaps weren't as good. And then when you read about it, you think, my goodness, this, this person really missed a lot of opportunities. And, I, <laughs> you know, and I'm reminded of like a, uh, an author we had on uh, a while back who wrote a great biography on Lee Marvin, the Oscar winning actor. And he told me about how Lee, you know, turned down movies like, you know, uh, The Sting and Jaws and several others. I mean, it was like almost a dozen blockbusters. And some of the work that he did was, was was not up to that level that he chose. So I just said, you know, again, it's it's. I guess it's a hit or miss. You know, sometimes we think. Well, we, we, I uh, because I started on top. Frankly, Mary Tyler Moore to me was the epitome of a good show. I never wanted to take anything that was less than that. So I turned down things that were enormously um, financially rewarding, but I didn't think had the quality. In the, in the early, I never was in it for the money particularly. I was in it for the craft and oh, the absolutely. experience. In the early 80s, I saw you turn down a chance to develop a new program called Entertainment Tonight. Yeah, that was stupid. That was stupid of me. But but they said I had to. I was doing it for free. I said, why would I do it for free? Who knew? Yeah. He said, well, maybe someday it'll go and you'll be on air. And I, yeah, that was dumb. <laughs> you uh, uh, fill me in on the year because I didn't get the the vibe uh, in terms of the actual time. I'm going to say it was in the 60s. You you actually were a contestant or a uh, on the dating game. Oh God, yeah. So it was. I guess it was. I don't know, late sixties. Yeah, okay. and they, and I chose a guy who was a, a mortician. And I said to them afterward, I can't go. He was just, I mean, he didn't smell of formaldehyde, but he looked like he could have. <laughs> Okay, I've heard of death warmed over, but that's that's another <laughs> way. Yeah. Okay, I got it. So, so in other words, there were people that would go would turn down the dates because some of the uh, what was your prize? Do you remember? Was it like a, uh, oh, a to go a, away on a weekend? I mean, was it a week in Austria or was it a week on Sunset God, I don't Strip? Know. Yeah. In the morgue. I don't know. Wow, because they used to give some pretty good prizes there. Yeah, um, this was not a good one. Not good enough. You did a short-lived talk show uh, with. Uh, I was fascinated by this. One of the guest was Christine Jorgensen. Fill oh. fill the uh, the viewer in on uh, for those who don't know Christine Jorgensen. Well, we did this show called um, Leave It to the Women. It was a remake of a very famous show that had been developed years ago. Chuck Barris was the producer, so he wanted to do kind of a quality show, but he had this other reputation. So it kind, of, but um, it was three people in a panel and a guest, and the guest. Um, of this show was Christian Jorgens, who was the first transsexual who made the transition and was famous from Denmark. And the guest that came on to the panel was this person who was going through transition, it was about a six foot two tall Marine who had like a very bad wig and kind of clumpy shoes and Christian Jorgens and was very witty and very glamorous and it was it was really fun, I will say. It wasn't very nice, but it was fun. 
So it was kind of like uh, to draw a correlation for those of today's uh, generation, kind of RuPaul's a uh, uh, Ru or uh, or Bruce, you know, you know that kind of that kind of yeah, <laughs> that, yeah, yeah. You know, that, but she uh, was a very famous, um, you know, very large personality, incredibly interesting person. Yeah. I want to get this in before we forget. Susan uh, does a radio commentary called Susan Says on uh, RobinHoodRadio.com. It's an NPR affiliate, and as uh, she's mentioned, also lectures on comedy. And, uh, uh, you know, obviously with your background, I have to ask, too, go, quick to go back to Viva Las Vegas. Did you ever know Terry Garr, who she was a dancer? Sure, I knew Terry. And, in fact, she came to rent my apartment in New York once when I was going back to L.A., a lovely, incredible girl who has, you know, kind of debilitating things she's going through, but terrific girl. Yeah, very good. Because she did like she was a dancer on like seven or eight of those those movies. Oh, and, was she? I didn't and, know yeah, that. And, and she yeah. had her store, her Elvis story as well. I guess oh. you did too. You went there, and it turned out you were the only one in there, and you decided, mm, I better, I better not get out of here. So. Well, I what happened was he had like I was a showgirl. And he he never talked to me, but I was in a scene with him. And he had about six or seven guys, this Memphis Mafia, that hung out with him all the time. And they came up to me after this day, and they said, Elvis is having a party tonight, and he wants you to come. I said, oh, cool, you know. So I went home. My uncle said, no, you're not going. I said, yes, I am. So I got in my convertible. I drove up to Bel Air. I wanted to be, like, fashionably late. So the party was 6.30. I think I got there at 7. The gate opened, and I drove in, and there were no cars there, just Elvis's Cadillac. And as I said, I was a little innocent Jewish virgin, and so I backed out of the driveway, and I never went to the party. And exited stage left. There we go. Yes. Uh, another quote from the book, quote, success brings loss of ambition. I say that a lot about uh, athletes sometimes, uh, uh, well-known musicians, especially if they're songwriters. They, people sometimes uh, uh, seem to reach a certain level and then for some reason just kind of lose the drive. Is that, that kind of how you felt uh, at one point? Yeah, in I your think career? a lot of drive is insecurity and trying to prove yourself to your mother, or at least in my case it was. And a lot of it is neurotic. And unless you're extremely interested in money, which I never was, and, you know, some people never can have enough money or never can have enough success, whatever. But I, I was a little lazy. I still am. So with some success, I was able to quit my career. And as I said, I took a year off to decide what else I wanted to do. And I did a whole other kind of thing that I don't know if we're going to talk about or not. But in, um, in Holocaust-related organizations, as an, another life. That's right. You reinvented yourself uh, first as a director of the Speakers Bureau at the uh, Anti-Defamation League. And then later on, what, in the early 90s, you were a U.N. observer for the uh, Simon Wiesenthal Center. Uh, so uh, your uh, an interest and involvement in uh, the nation of Israel certainly grew from there. And then politics. Uh, uh, you had a chance uh, that I understand to have a drink or perhaps more with uh, former uh, presidential candidate George McGovern. Oh, my gosh. I, my first foray into politics was at, well, I was in California, and um, he had run for president, and he had a huge debt to retire. And so this fellow that I knew said, we're doing a fundraiser. Would you help? So I said, sure. And I met George McGovern, who, of course, I worshipped, and he was all my politics. And everything was wonderful, and we were talking. And he said, well, would you like to have a drink afterward? I said, oh, yes. And then Warren Beatty came up. He said, oh, George, how are you? Let's go out. And I was left. Wow. So you, I have a picture, though. I have a picture of the four of us lined up. So you got, in a sense, dissed by McGovern by a guy yeah. who probably uh, was like the Wilt Chamberlain of, uh, of uh, female conquest. So that that's, uh, again. Well, I think Warren could do more for him than I could at that point. So. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> but now you've come in, uh, in contact with a lot of famous people, uh, uh, Bill Clinton, uh, Shimon Peres, uh, former Israeli prime minister, uh, Bill Bradley, my goodness, the Ted Kennedy you got to know, uh, 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 Anita Hill, Professor Anita Hill, who many would remember from uh, kind of a uh, uh, an early Me Too movement back in the early 90s, uh, uh, which uh, is a whole other story. I did an event when I was at the... Um Anti-Defamation League, we did an event with Studs Terkel, the famous writer, and with Anita Hill, 
I think it was in Florida, and she was amazing. And it was, you know, it was really interesting. I met a tremendous amount of political people and interesting people. I was booking, I ran the Speakers Bureau, so I was booking the events for our, for our events. And, yeah, that was very interesting. And that got me into the politics, which I love and I'm still very much involved with. And as far as Israel goes, I'm very involved with the Friends of the Israel Defense Force. I have three soldiers I send to college on a program we call the Impact Program. In fact, I'm going next month to see my boys there. Now, you, uh, you talk in the book, you uh, uh, took a group of Israeli soldiers, you actually took them to the uh, uh, infamous uh, Auschwitz uh, death camp um, yeah. in Poland. That was an unbelievable experience. Um, I'm, I'm very involved with FIDF, and we have a mission that goes to Poland and takes the soldiers. I got to fly in an Israeli Air Force plane, which is really exciting, with 50 soldiers. We took them to Auschwitz, and it was such an extraordinary and meaningful and upsetting experience, obviously, and I was doing pretty well until we got into this room. And I, my father was very involved with Holocaust-related things, and I grew up in Milwaukee where there was an active German Bund during the war, and my father was very involved with that, so I kind of got that interest from him. But I went into Auschwitz, and there were a lot of terrible things to see, but there was a room with this piece of fabric that was like 60 feet long, and I said, what is that? And they said it was made of human hair. Wow. And that's when I lost it. I wasn't able to deal with uh, I, that. I'm, I'm sure that, uh, and again, obviously you're seeing, uh, you know, it in its uh, kind of, uh, not infancy, the opposite of that. You're seeing it like probably uh, cleaned up a lot, obviously uh, nothing like it was. That, I don't you know, know, but it was awful. But yeah. it was very important for the kids, the soldiers, to understand what they're fighting for in Israel and this being their heritage, and it was an extraordinary experience. I, yeah. I, I, I would never go back, but it was a great experience. Now, have you had a chance to ever go to the uh, the Holocaust Museum in Washington? Yes, yeah, I did. I was there a few years ago. and that, that You yeah. come out of there, and believe me, if you're not a changed person, then there's something wrong, i got to tell you. Well, what was so interesting about that to me was, as much as I know about the whole thing, how organized they were. It was like a factory and, and they have it look like that. It was so, they kept such extreme paperwork. That's why we know everything. It was so, such a strange mindset yeah. that the oh. Nazis had that was, you know, to keep records of everything and to, to treat it like a factory. Now, uh, it, we move to the, uh, the present. Uh, uh, what, uh, what projects are you embarking on? And then in the remaining moments uh, with uh, Susan Silver, uh, tell us about Auntie Susie. Oh, well, that's my favorite thing of all time. So I say that the third R is relationships. I don't have kids. I don't have family. So I'm kind of like a baby whisperer. If I see a cute baby, I go up to them. I always say one of these days I'll be arrested. But I... So I go to something called the Renaissance Weekends that Bill and Hillary used to go to. It's kind of you're invited to talk about your field, and there's all kinds of interesting people there. And I was on a panel, a very serious panel, and I was talking about Clint Eastwood, I mean, because that's what I do. And the guy next to me was talking about how his baby had almost died of a rare heart disease, the same disease that Jimmy Kimmel's baby has, Tetralogy Fellow. And I was crying by the end of it, and I saw him later, and there was this unbelievably beautiful baby. And I looked at the baby, and the baby looked at me, and I looked at the baby, and I said, can I pick her up? And the parents said, yes. I picked her up. She started to kiss me here. I started to cry. They started to cry. And she's now my goddaughter. There you go. So see Most now. Most beautiful child in the world, cutest child. She's a robust six years old. She's going to have her, op her second operation this summer, which unfortunately has to be. And then she has one more when she's grown. But she is just the love of my life, and, and I'm Auntie Susie. S O O Z I E. There you go. Busy, busier than ever. It's funny how life takes us in different twists and turns, isn't it? She is so funny and so cute. And so she said to me, When you're 100, I'll come and take care of you and I'll bring games. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Well, I said, Could you come when I'm 85? She said, No, I'll be too busy. I'll have my own kids. There, wow. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's a pistol. Well, on that upbeat note, we, uh, we'd like to thank uh, Susan Silver for joining us here for the hour on Studio 411, the book uh, Hot Pants in Hollywood, High Mountain Press, the publisher. For more information on the book, uh, hotpantsinhollywood.com. Susan, it's been a joy. Uh, we look Thank forward you. to you writing more, and uh, we want to have you back.
back on and talk about more stuff because we barely scratched the surface with uh, all the. You all are the great. Good. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Absolutely. You hang in there for a second. Uh, we thank you for joining us here on this uh, hour of Studio 411. Larry De Silva is my name, and uh, we look forward to seeing you next time. Take care.